Good morning, everyone. One, welcome to Grand Rounds. My name is David Wessel, Chief Medical Officer, and it's my pleasure to introduce the Grand Rounds speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Mike Bell is a fairly recently arrived new chief. He came to us from uh, at the Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, uh, where he was a notable investigator in the intensive care unit organizing uh, international trials to look at traumatic brain injury and also to give us a perspective on a new way to look at trial design, more adaptive trial thinking and other ways to look at uh, clinical trials that give us more information about the way that we um, design our trials and gather information and conclude ways to treat our patients in, in a better fashion. Uh, Mike is the also recently endowed professor uh, named the DC Lawyers Care for Children, Chair of Pediatric Critical Care Medicine here. He's been off to a rousing start uh, and uh, at about 10 o'clock last night, he and I were on the phone and of the 44 expanded intensive care beds in the pediatric ICU, all 44 had patients in them. Uh, so he's been managing uh, the hotel as well as managing some very critically ill patients and the administrative aspects of running a large ICU, uh, he's uh, accomplished uh, brilliantly. And we really welcome him uh, to Washington and congratulate on him on the first uh, three or four months and look forward to your talk this morning. Thanks, Dr. Westville, appreciate it. And thanks everyone for coming right early in the morning. Um, I wanted to uh, give you a talk today on traumatic brain injury and particularly the ADAPT trial, which stands for Approaches and Decisions for Acute PWTBI. tbi I want to give you a Rorschach test this morning, and if you think this is a neuron that has a brain in it, you're basically a neurologist like Joey Skippy in the back of the room, and if you think it's a brain that's exploding, you're a trauma person like me. So uh, I was not in charge of the logo, but someone else did, and I think it is a good Rorschach test for us. I don't have any disclosures of NIH grants that I have, and I'll discuss um, the ADAPT trial extensively today, so there's nothing else to disclose from companies or anything else. So the goal of this talk, which I put together for uh, for, the, for this morning, is to describe to the group the importance of pediatric TBI in the epidemiology of public health, to describe the challenges of the current treatment of children with severe TBI, to describe and to describe our preliminary findings and potential new findings uh, that will be developed as a result of the ADAPT trial. Uh, as you're think, as you're listening to the talk, I'd like to. to um, I'm going to talk a lot about traumatic brain injury today, and hopefully I'll teach some of the young folks about traumatic brain injury things they don't know. But there'll be folks in the room who don't take care of traumatic brain injury at all and may have other diseases that are sort of there barely with, whether it's asthma or sickle cell or congenital heart disease surgery or whatever. I think the, uh, the point for those folks in the room is to see um, the methodology that I'm talking about, see how many of these things hit home, and maybe this methodology might work in other diseases. I think that's an important piece of the puzzle. Um, so the reasons for that trial are two. The uh, evidence-based guidelines for severe TBI in children uh, are relatively poor, which I'll describe in detail. And that leads to clinical protocols that are used in RCTs that are also poor. And I think that also contributes to the fact that RCTs have not worked. So uh, that's the reasons why we did this study in the first place. And we have discovered over the course of time, and we're about four years into the study, uh, that we need to understand the disease better and understand how care has evolved over the years in a more effective way to try to develop, to try to reach our two goals. So the importance of TBI is difficult to overestimate at this point. Uh, and with the public understanding more things about uh, head injury from football players and soccer players and uh, mild TBI people, I think it's becoming more, uh, it's becoming more evident. But uh, the European Commission reports that 2.5 million people in their, uh, in their sovereignty uh, suffer TBI each year. About a million are admitted to a hospital uh, and 75,000 will die. In the U.S., the numbers are basically the same, just based on population. 1.9 million suffer a reportable TBI based on the CDC criteria, and 55,000 will die. It's a leading cause of death disability in young adults. The incidence of elderly is increasing. People are falling down, living longer and falling down stairs. It can strike any of us, but if you're a male in the room, you're twice as likely as a female to experience a TBI. Uh, younger patients have different mechanisms than older patients, and the risks of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and ALS are only now being, being even considered and understood. So what's the most, what are the most urgent problems to address, in my opinion? So uh, importantly, there are no proven effective treatments whatsoever for the entire spectrum and the entire age range, uh, and that's what I've been focusing on. Other groups, including uh, adult uh, TBI specialists, are focusing on the categorization based on the GCS score, which I'll talk about in a second. 
as I said earlier, the randomized controlled trials have, have failed to show efficacy, and in fact, over 50 have failed to show efficacy over the course of the last several decades. Uh, and how to care for patients on a long-term basis is completely unclear whether you're a military person in combat, whether you're injured in sports, other locations. Uh, so really we have, uh, are starting from scratch basically as far as I can tell uh, in the field. There are several efforts ongoing right now regarding this, and we just actually had a meeting with this group uh, the last two days, so uh, it's good to update uh, people about this. So the top left corner uh, is Center TBI, that's the European consortium. Uh, that, is in, that has enrolled 20,000 people across Europe looking to establish a categorization scheme which is better than the current one is. The symbol on the left is a uh, symbol from Track TBI, a U.S.-based uh, foundation uh, that has, has 15 centers in the U.S. that's studying 3,000 adults, mostly with mild TBI. Uh, NINDS, which is the National Institute of North Disease and Stroke, has developed common data elements so all these different studies can talk to each other. They're all being deposited into a repository called Zipper, and ADAPT is one of these uh, one of these studies that's doing that. So why is PDF TBI important? Uh, so based on the CDC, there's about 7,400 deaths per year of children under 19 from TBI alone. Uh, that's about 20 per day. Uh, if you assume a 20% mortality, which is what we uh, what we observed basically in the ADAPT trial, uh, then there's escalating numbers of, of, of children who suffer severe TBI every year. In our most recent studies, about half the children have poor outcome in six months. So if you do some just relative math, there's 1.3 million life years just from severe TBI alone that's affected. Um, if you could contrast that uh, in cancer, there's 3,000 deaths each year, all different cancers, uh, blood, ca blood cancers, solid organs, whatever. So I think cancer is a very important disease to study. I do think TBI is also uh, has a big public health concern as well. Look at the leading causes of death, uh, and I could put this slide up in the last 25 years. Uh, the, blue, the blue boxes uh, are unintentional injuries. About three quarters of these are TBI related. So between ages of one and 44, your most likely cause of death is probably TBI. You can see in the, in the youngest phases, there's other congenital anomalies and heart disease, uh, but unintentional injuries are still quite high in this group. And as you get older, it, it drops off with different things uh, causing increased death. So uh, I think. TBI is, is a huge public health concern. The red and the green boxes are homicide and suicide, respectively, uh, and a portion of these are also TBI related. So I said I said earlier the Glasgow Coma Scale score is, is is the gold standard, and this is the basic score that's been used since 1974. Um, use uh, has now uh, morphed into a, a severity of injury score, which is required for all research to be done in TBI. So the severe TBI is GCS less than or equal to eight. It's been not validated for that purpose, but it still is what the field is, um, is left with. And the, my adult colleagues believe that this GCS score of less than or equal to eight is insufficient to randomize people in the clinical trials. I, d I tend to agree with that, but it's not the direction I went when I was assessing the pediatric field. So I'll go into their, de in their uh, information in a little bit of detail. So when I was in Pittsburgh, and I've been here for maybe six or seven months now, um, I developed a, we developed this protocol, it's been around for 20 years. There's a similar one here in, in D.C., which I just didn't put up because it's too small to actually see anything at all um, on the screen. Uh, but what's the evidence for all these things and all the detail we have here? Some of the evidence is from local studies that we performed in Pittsburgh. So uh, in Pittsburgh, the belief was that uh, you should not give glucose early because that might cause more cell death, and you should use normal saline alone. Uh, there's a big controversy in our group about hypoglycemia. Do we cause more trouble or not? So we did a study with this. The local study was about 58 patients. Rebecca Smith was one of our fellows back in the day, uh, looking at 58, 57 patients, I'm sorry, uh, with a mortality rate of 8.6%, an average age of about uh, uh, nine years or so. She looked at just the early glucose levels. Uh, so took all the mean glucose levels in the early time period. So the, our protocol we had was to not give glucose for 48 hours, and then to give it from 40, hour 49 till the first seven days. So these periods are those two, so in the early period, Looking at all mean glucose levels at all, we saw no difference whatsoever between people with favorable in the light bars and unfavorable outcomes in the dark bars. You can see a signal here later that there was a signal that seems like hyperglycemia, which is a controversial topic. People believe hyperglycemia should either be treated aggressively or not. Uh, you can see here that in our observational study of just simply looking at patients over several years, there was a signal here that seemed that if you had a mean glucose greater than, uh, in mean glucose of patients who had unfavorable outcomes was slightly greater. Uh, we looked at episodic hyper hypoglycemia as well. So we had categorized patients with early normal glycemia, which means every glucose was under 150 uh, in the first 48 hours. 
early mild hyperglycemia was a glucose, you had one glucose between 150 and 200 in that early time period. And early severes, which was the, which was the largest category, had a glucose greater than 200 in the first 48 hours. And then you can see how they stratified out in, into other groups as they went along. The bottom line, that's what you get sort of deep, you get into the details here, is in the early time period, the normal glycemic, mild hyperglycemic, and severe glycemics really was no difference in patients who had good outcome. It was simply, you know, basically the same across the board. However, again, later on, severe hyperglycemia was associated with worse outcome. And so in this, in this study of 58 patients, which is in the current TBI guidelines, um, we just see some, some hint that glucose is an important uh, predictor of mortality. However, I don't think anyone in this room would look at 58 patients from a single center in Pittsburgh and change their, their clinical practice, which, which is part of the problem of TBI research. Importantly, some of my colleagues thought hypoglycemia would be very common. We saw very little five episodes in more than 6,000 readings, of which three of them happened when patients were getting dextrose. So we didn't see that as a problem at all. Along the same lines as glucose is energy expenditure and nutritional support. So Haif Matawe, one of our talented fellows is now at Toronto State Kids, uh, did a study looking at metabolic heart. Uh, studied 30 children, uh, many were excluded because of different problems. Eventually had 13 in the, in the overall study. And in this study, we were trying to prove how much energy the patients need in the early time period after, after TBI. The current guidelines had been, and still are, that 160 to 180% of total calorie expenditure is expected to be administered because patients are very hypermetabolic. But we found that to not be so in our patients. Uh, again, a busy slide, I don't want to get you the details, but we did measure the measured energy expenditure compared to the predicted based on two different equations. Um, also the temperature of the patients, ICP of the patients, what medications they were getting, uh, neurological medications as well as uh, neuroscopic aid. What we found at the bottom line was that instead of 180%, which would be up here somewhere the, above the board, uh, we found about 75% of expected more, uh, energy expenditure was being, was what we measured. So this implies that we shouldn't have to feed children overly aggressively after severe TBI. But again, a 13-patient study in a single center is hard to convince anybody of doing anything uh, in the current day and age. So the real, the real crux of the, of the evidence is in the guidelines. The guidelines for, for severe TBI has been sponsored by the Brain Trauma Foundation for the last uh, 15 or 20 years. In 2012, this was published. I was happy to be one of the experts on the panel, along with thir three statisticians, librarians, uh, the panel identified 15 topics that's expected to be associated with outcomes from TDF TBI. The guidelines were peer-reviewed by more than a dozen outside experts and endorsed by more than 10 societies. To be included, severe TBI was defined as it currently is, GCS less than nine or less than or equal to eight. That's, a, that's a, the same thing. We need to identify a population of children less than 18 years of age and a measurable relevant health outcome, which included either um, usually mortality or a functional outcome of GOS scores. Uh, also, ICP was, was um, and it was an was a acceptable outcome uh, for an ICP related therapy. Uh, we had three levels of recommendations, class one, two, and three. Class one therapies must be done, class two therapies should be considered, and class three may be considered. And this is when I start getting depressed, sorry. There's 5,000 abstracts we identified, 600 manuscripts, and eventually got 37 to the guidelines. There were no level one recommendations whatsoever, so there was no therapy that everyone must do. Uh, which is why I start getting depressing. Of the four level two recommendations that were in the guidelines, three are things you should avoid. So you should avoid steroids because of several RCTs that showed it was harmful. You should avoid hypothermia because there's now three RCTs showing it's not beneficial and one said it's actually properly harmful. And an immune enhanced diet from Greece was ineffective at doing anything besides making Greek people have a different diet. Um, the only one that was positive was hypertonic saline should be considered. It was a study from 18 children in Seattle in 1992. The level three recommendations are listed here, so you can just read through the list, and I'll leave it up here for a second or two so you can see. You can see here the promiscuity of the guidelines is that everything may be considered, so you, should consider, you may consider ICP monitoring. If you consider it, and Dr. Chima uh, in, in the back of the room says he doesn't want to do it, then he's, he's followed the guidelines, you consider it. Uh, ICP thresholds uh, are all things you should consider, but again, if you follow them or don't follow them, there's really, there's not enough evidence to sort of compel any of these things to happen, which is, I think, part of the problem. One of the reasons why the guidelines are not effective is that the failure of, of RCTs. So there have now been, uh, this is a list of pediatric RCTs that have been, uh, that have met the guideline criteria. Uh, you can see here there's very little, uh, there's very few mechanisms that have been tested, steroids, hypertonic saline, um, peaking for surgery and hypothermia has been extensively tested in the last several years. Uh, the number of patients is quite, is quite small in this group, the largest being 225 from the Hutchinson study in 2008. 
And the only one that was positive was this one demonstrating that hypertonic saline in the first 24 hours lowers ITP uh, for 24 hours. It's not even treating intracranial hypertension, it's treating uh, a single number. So why the, why the studies have failed, why they failed, and why the PWD guidelines are so terrible, which I just told, told you about. Uh, some have argued, mostly adult practitioners, that uh, none of therapy has been tested yet in children. I kind of agree with that piece of it. There are fewer animal models that are relevant. I agree with that as well. The number of children in RTTs is, is simply too small. I agree with that, as you can see from the previous slide. And then this learning curve of investigators I hear quite a bit, and I think that's just sort of a pandering, basically. But uh, for, to answer all these questions, I'll point to some evidence from Dr. Andrew Moss out of, uh, out of the European Commission, because uh, I think he answers most of these in the adult world as well. He did a study called uh, Impact Study, and this is part of that study where he reviewed every RCT from the early 80s uh, in, into uh, 2007 or 2008. Um, looking at this list here, here's the, here's the publication, again, from 1983, different mechanisms that, that have been tried, different centers, how many centers have used the therapy, what, what population is almost all severe TBI in this group, number of patients per study, here's in the hundreds and even the thousands, the year it was completed, and the results. And I won't bore you with the entire list. Uh, I can go on for three different slides for this. Uh, this is the last slide, but the summary of it is that there's some, been some success in single-center RTTs, but none in multi center RTTs. Uh, and again, the adult conclusion is that the stratification system has been, um, has been faulty, but I think they're actually missing the point. Uh, the impact study uh, reviewed 13 large RCTs in depth, uh, observational and RCTs uh, together, a total of 10,000 patients uh, across 265 clinical centers, about half the patients did poorly at six months. And the important part of this slide is the effect of the clinical site, which is where you went at any given time had a greater effect than any of the treatments that were being tested. So if you went to a site that had good outcomes, you did well. If you went to a site that had poor outcomes, you did poorly. And the important thing for the European Commission was that the European sites did worse than U.S. sites. This uh, energized the European Commission to uh, fund the Center TBI study, which I mentioned earlier, which then energized the NIH to work with them and to fund ADAPT. So I'm very grateful for this study to, um, to spur the field. So I told you earlier that I think that the adult TBI folks think the stratification is not correct, and I think this is actually the problem. Um, I think um, for decades and decades and decades, we've all been in medical school, uh, we were taught the scientific method is you see a problem and to use a TBI-related therapy at some point back in 1900, uh, if you do a thought experiment, uh, someone would figure out that mannitol or hypertonic saline might shrink the brain in front of them. So maybe the neurosurgeon would give mannitol to a, a, a small animal and find that the brain shrunk in front of them and said, oh, this is something I might be able to use clinically. In that case, um, you see a novel observation and you decide, hey, I think this, this medication might work, so let's do it in the phase one study in my place and I'll take my, my, my patients and see that, that they benefit from it and do a phase one study and get IRB approval and do the entire, you know, sort of a work that we now need to do to do clinical trials and maybe see a positive effect in your site. Uh, and then you go to a phase two study, which means you need to get some safety and efficacy data and some feasibility data to make sure it's actually possible to do it more than just once that maybe do your site plus someone else's site that you know quite well. Um, once this happens and you, get the, and you get past this point, you do phase three trials, and phase three trials happen here all the time. There's lots of phase three studies in cancer, uh, in, in neurosurgical diseases, in epilepsy diseases, and, and medications. You do a phase three trial, we do this trial, you need to go to all your friends in the entire field to make sure it's applicable across the entire population. And this is where all the studies fail. Uh, once you get this to work, then you implement it across, across everywhere else and you improve care. So this paradigm has been what we've been working on for decades. Unfortunately, this assumes several things. It assumes that all of the aspects of care besides the intervention are identical. So it assumes that you're a small furry animal who is in a small, is in a lab, the same technician doing the same experiment every single day. Uh, but patients don't work that way. TBI doesn't work that way at all. Uh, it's very heterogeneous. The treatments are quite heterogeneous. And I think this is the problem, is that everyone assumes that the power of, of large numbers will overcome this part of it, which I think is where we're failing at this. So, when we're starting out looking at the ADAPT trial, the hypothermia study we, that I was doing in Pittsburgh had failed, and we started looking at, well, what do we do next? Again, I, I showed you earlier, we have some preliminary data on a, ver a variety of different things. Uh, but we started asking, well, what are your medical goals? So we looked at for 32 uh, international sites and said, what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish in your in TBI? Uh, this is all self-reported. So we asked some of the guideline questions. So diverting CSF is one of the therapies. So we asked, do you divert CSF or not? And about a third of them said they never divert CSF. Uh, the other two-thirds did divert CSF. Some of them diverted continuously, which is what we did in Pittsburgh. Some do some other strategy of that. 
we asked which hyperosmolar therapy you use, and some folks never use mannitol. They, they claim they lie because they do. Uh, and some folks never use hypertrine saline, and they lie because they do. Um, so then we asked which therapy do you, which of the hypertrine saline solutions do you use? Uh, and one of the sites said they use seven different concentrations depending on the ICU tending on for the day, uh, which I think is just kind of insane. It's actually worse than the, in the actual information, though. We asked when do you start feeding kids, and some folks feed kids right away, and some folks feed kids later on and think this is sort of the, uh, the trend that we're seeing. And we asked when do you have glucose. Again, the Pittsburgh team gives glucose right here. Some folks follow us. Some folks do earlier on. And we think all these different therapies affect outcomes in some ways that we don't understand, and all these different therapies will affect the clinical protocol of another drug you're trying to try to treat these patients. So if you have all this noise going on about the basic aspects of care, um, I think it makes your randomized controlled trial almost impossible to prove. So rather than design an RCT, which we had plenty of data to design another RCT and, and hope that it would succeed, uh, if we designed that RCT, we'd have to hope the clinical sites would perform basic care the way we do it, because obviously we're the experts because it's our study, um, and then exclude kids who don't who might contribute introduce variabilities to make sure we make it as narrow as possible to try to get to the small furry animal experiment. Um, in compared to effectiveness research, what we do instead is we compare the effectiveness of these strategies in, real, in the real world. So we let sites take care of children whatever way they want to take care of them. We let the variability come into the study. We correct for it statistically and need to increase sample size in order to get enough power to see differences. So this is the, the CER study is what we did for, for ADAPT. So I called this study the multi-medical therapies proposal, but no one else liked that, liked, liked that idea, so I had to change it because my colleagues thought I was not being creative enough. So what we did, we enrolled 1,000 children across 51 sites, 34, international, 34 U.S. sites and 17 international sites. We had specific aims for all these different therapies, which I'll show you in more detail in a second, and our primary outcome was GOSEP the six months. Importantly, inclusion criteria was less than 18 years of age, IC monitor place at the study hospital. Uh, and severe TBI based on GCS score, and the only exclusion was pregnancy. So we included almost everyone who could possibly get included. The IRBs of all these sites allowed us to collect data on consecutive patients at all clinical sites, and then we can send the patients for outcome testing. So this is a consecutive cohort. There shouldn't so there should not be any bias to be, to be based on inclusion criteria. So our team is a bunch of experts. Um, Steve Wisniewski is my statistician. He's the vice provost of the University of Pittsburgh and uh, the head of the data coordinating center there. We have the TBI experts across the world, David Adelson, Jamie Hutchinson, Pat Kohanek, Robert Tasker, Monica Bavalala, an outcomes expert, and then four statisticians who have uh, more degrees than I can mention. Here are therapies. So the, the novel thing about ADAPT is that we have pre-identified 12 hypotheses, which we hope to be 12 new level two guidelines when we finish the entire study. So you can see here, we chose that continuous CSS version would be, would be better, and it would be associated with fewer, fewer ISP, other ISP therapies. That was just a just the strong hypothesis. We're happy to prove the opposite. Proving the opposite for me is just, just as well as proving the, proving the, the primary hypothesis of these. We have hypotheses related to hyperosmolar therapies, hyperventilation, hypoxia, nutrition, and glucose. And so we're hoping to get these 12 proven or disproven, either way is fine, um, and then get 12 new level two guidelines for the, for, the, uh, for the guidelines document, which will give us 16 guidelines, which we hope to be more rigorous than our current four. Progress to date, um, we started funding in July 2013. Our enrollments began late in February 2014 and we finished in uh, about a year ago or so. Uh, we have several answer studies going on currently and we've had uh, seven papers accepted, actually as of eight, we had one accepted last night, so it was nice. Um, other papers in development, we see have a long list of things we're trying to do, we're trying to develop. Um, uh, we took our first 200 patients, which is a large sample size for a TBI study and, and looking at different characteristics related to mortality. Uh, we're trying to develop Pritchard models for mortality as well as morbidity. We have a CT scan scoring system, a pilot score, which is the level of intensity of ICP therapies. We're looking at international versus U.S. centers, which I can show some of the data later uh, about this. We're looking at multi-trauma versus, uh, uh, versus other things, uh, effective transfusion therapy, sedation practices, ICP monitoring times, and fluid resuscitation effects. And this is just so we have currently have 45 papers in development of some sort. I wanted to give you some data that we have from the first 200 patients. Uh, so one of the important socioeconomic as well as uh, um, as well as uh, societal factors related to TBI is child abuse. And so uh, as a cohort of patients that's consecutive, we decided to look at uh, the, the um, characteristics of ch children with child abuse and how that is different from patients who were uh, accidentally injured. So obviously some of these things are relatively self-evident where the age of the patients who were abused is obviously, is obviously less, 1.7 years versus 
9.2 years, uh, not surprising. For some reason, which we can't understand, uh, females are more likely than males to, have to suffer child abuse. It didn't appear to be a cultural thing. Most of these were U.S.-based centers, but there seemed to be a, a female prominence, which is uh, novel to the field. We looked at the Reva injury score, which is uh, a trauma score based on how many organs are injured in various other places. So you see here there's from head, neck, thorax, all the different various body regions. And for some reason, in abused ch children, the thorax is spared. There's less thoracic injuries than in the other groups. Uh, that's true for injury disparity scores, which is mathematically linked to the AIS score. We looked at pre-hospital events. So the children with um, the children with abuse had much more apnea than the, uh, than the non-abused children. We looked at seizures. Before they got to the hospital, abused children had more seizures. And you can see here all the list of things we were checking, so looking for cardiac arrest, uh, hypertension, hypoxia, hyperthermia, with all these different uh, secondary injuries. But the only one that popped out in this uh, analysis was seizures. We looked at seizures after the kids got to the hospital, so before they got the ICU monitor, but as they got to the hospital, they had more seizures as well. They got more, more, more barbiturates, and they had a different fluid balance. They had more fluid in and less fluid out based on, this is a raw data, but based on milligrams per kilogram has also stood up as a difference between the between groups. They had differences in their, their hematopoietic systems, so they had lower hemoglobins, and they had more, uh, they had a, a, a higher uh, PTT time, uh, indicating that they were more coagulopathic. And importantly, and I think this is important for the field, uh, there is a tendency in the field to think that the abuse of head trauma children are all going to die, and so they shouldn't get aggressive monitoring. So in our case, we did see that the, mor that the mortality of the abuse of head trauma kids was slightly higher, 26% versus 18.1%. However, it didn't reach statistical significance. So I do think this does demonstrate that abuse of head trauma children should be treated just as aggressively as older kids because more than three quarters of them, or about three quarters of them do survive their injuries. Um, secondly, we looked at the GCF score. As I said earlier, the GCF score has been, uh, been challenging to use for, for stratification for, um, for clinical trials. However, its utility in TBI is uh, is basically uh, uniform across the field. But we tried to look at GCS scores of, here's the GCS scores threes, fours, fives, six, sevens, and eights, and look at the mortality, look at the, our, our frequency here is how many patients had each of the different scores. So we did a tripartite score, as uh, one of my colleagues named it. So looking at G, comparing GCS of the threes compared to fours to fives compared to six to eight. So you can see the, the different, different strata here because we're seeing if there are differences between characteristics and differences in mortality in the end. We saw no differences in characteristics between males, females, different races, different uh, primary languages. We also saw no differences between the, diff the three different groups based on mechanism of injury, uh, the type of injury, and the, and the cause of injury. So we can see here, basically the entire analysis was, was uh, non -di no differences, which was fine. We did see, again, the AAS scores and the injury surgery scores, there's no differences here, but we did see that the patients with um, GCS scores of three had a greater amount of apnea compared to GCS 6 to 8. That's this little uh, asterisk right there. They had more cardiac arrest than, uh, than both groups. Uh, the GCS 3 had more cardiac arrest than both other groups, which is not too surprising. Uh, looking at other complications, uh, hyperthermia was different. Uh, they received more anticonvulsants than, than, um, than the GCS 6 to 8. They had differences in the, the platelet, the, um, the hematopoietic system was actually different between all different groups where they had differences in, in uh, platelets, PT, PT times, but PTT times, uh, INRs, as well as bicarbonate concentrations. So you can see here, this is a 200 patient sample, which is a large sample for severe, for severe TBI kids, just trying to identify new things people can study later to see, to pick up after we get finished uh, to move on things. These are the PRISM3 variables. You can see here there's any number of different variables that are different between different groups. And again, this is just trying to look at the epidemiology of the disease itself to sort of determine differences between different GCS scores. And again, looking at fixed pupils versus intubated patients, you can see there are also differences in the uh, other neurological exam findings. So importantly, we try to look at mortality and look here on the top line. Uh, and the adjusted analysis is, is the final bars over here. So a GCS of three has a 13-fold increased risk of mortality compared to the six to eights, and GCS scores of four to fives had a six-fold six increased mortality compared to six to eights. So from what I take out of this information is if you do a randomized controlled trial and don't stratify for GCS scores going in in, in in children, and you happen to put a whole bunch of patients who are GCS of threes into, into, one, into one randomized strata and just happen by chance to put six to eights into the other, you're going to get differences in outcomes just based on those things alone. Uh, and so that's not been uh, 
categorized before, and we're hoping to make sure this is true for future trials in ART and PDF TBI. Try to look at the effect of multi-trauma. So the AIS scores of, are, are categorized here. Uh, a head score of greater than three is severe, and this an AIS score is based on imaging findings for the most part. So threes are, great, are severe based on CT findings alone. So you can see there's just a few patients of ours who didn't qualify for severe TBI based on, um, based on these scores. Uh, looking at if you have a, if you have a, an a, a, high, a, a severe AS score in different regions, you can see the differences here, uh, and you can see here that there's quite a bit of injuries in different regions for patients in our study, including 180 patients had a lower extremity, which was a severe injury. 125 patients had a severe thoracic injury. So you can see here that our, our mixture patients is not necessarily all just isolated head injury at all. We looked at the at the at the highest head injuries, like if you had a severe TBI based on AS scores, what are the other injuries you had here? So the surgery of somatic organs was uh, quite substantial in various places. Uh, how many organs were affected? How many different places were affected? So 601 patients had a single uh, a single AS score greater than three. So you can see here more than uh, more than 40 percent of the patients had uh, more than one uh, organ being injured, including the head. So I can share some other information about the entire cohort for you. I don't want to. I can't get to the primary outcomes just yet because we haven't finished the entire analysis. I do want to give you a flavor for what we've actually been observing. So the mean age of our cohort is 7.55 years. The mean, G the mean GCS score at the time of IT monitor placement is 5.2, which is about a point or a half lower than the average uh, a severe TBI study that's been done in the past, probably due to our inclusion criteria being so broad. Racial mixture is as we kind of expected, 56 percent Caucasian, 21% uh, black. Uh, I, do use the, I, need to, I do need to use the word black because African American doesn't apply to our study because lots of people were from other places that were not American. So 11.3% uh, of the U.S. population was Hispanic, had 18.7% mortality, which is 187 kids. Uh, cause of injury was diverse. The types of injury was mostly closed, but some open. Um, we had 13, 134 kids who were uh, child abuse that were probable or definite, and 56 gunshot wounds, of which all of them were in the U.S. except for one. Before ICP monitors were placed, 74 kids had a cardiac arrest. Uh, 89 kids had a sat less than 90 for more than 30 minutes. 180 kids had seizures. Uh, Type was given to 30, 350 kids, and mantle was given to 250 kids. Uh, importantly, sedatives, which is a topic that's been difficult to actually study at all in TBI, 25% uh, of the kids received propofol on day one, and 12.7% received on day two, indicating they probably were on an infusion. Uh, and propofol has a black box warning against it for. Uh, Continuous, and continuous medications in the, in the ICU. 12% of children received dexmedetomidine. Dexmedetomidine lowers brain oxygen concentrations by 50% uh, in normal controls. 12% of our kids got it regardless. Uh, importantly, more than half the kids in ADAPT got a tier 2 therapy in the first 24 hours. That was hyperthermia, barbiturates, or decompressed surgery for ICP. Uh, we didn't study tier 2 therapies because we assumed that they'd be relatively infrequent and be delayed, but uh, in looking at things, they actually got things quite early. Uh, so we think this is uh, right for the a future study. In diverting CSF, we assume that about a third of the kids would get continuous CSF diversion, about a third would get intermittent, and about a third would get none. Instead, about a third got either continuous diversion therapies and three quarter, and two thirds got uh, no diversion. So we're doing that analysis currently. Um, to identify the variability that's, that's uh, present in our ICUs, uh, we administered 40,000 doses of hypertonic saline. Currently, there's six concentrations available in the, on the market. Somehow, ADAPT sites managed to administer 31 different concentrations uh, by mixing and matching things and making their own home-brewed concoctions. There are 8,000 doses of mantle that were administered. There's only two concentrations that are commercially available, and somehow we managed to, to administer nine different concentrations. Uh, PB2 monitoring was used in 9% of the patients. And nutritional support, which we thought would be uh, very important to look at, uh, ranged from, 100, from 0 to 400% of expected uh, calories administered in the first, uh, first week after TBI. <laughs> with approximately 20% of kids never getting fed at all. So the variability in these things is just enormous and actually dwarfs what we thought we were going to find when we started the study out. So to conclude, this has been considered the golden age of TBI research. Uh, I hope I taught you something about TBI in the last uh, uh, 40 minutes or so. Uh, we do anticipate that we'll prove 12 of our hypotheses one way or another, and I don't have any sort of stake in either of the direction it goes, uh, and provide much more information uh, to be gleaned from this unique opportunity. We do hope to enroll a second cohort of subjects to test these tier two therapies and TBI subtypes. 
And we do think, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, that this methodology could be used in other diseases that, that you guys, <coughs> excuse me, that you guys all are more interested in. <coughs> With sepsis, septic shock, respiratory failure, could all be uh, use similar methodology to make some important differences. I wanted to close with Peter Saffer was one of my mentors back in the day. He had laws for negotiating life, and sometimes life is hard to negotiate. Um, but these are some, some of his ideas. I'm going to leave the slide up for, during questions so you can pick out your favorite. The ones with the arrows are my favorite. So thanks for your attention, and happy to take any questions. <coughs> Yeah, testing. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. It was a really good talk. When you talked about um, the non-accidental trauma, as you said, that the mortality rate actually was different than what you expected, what about the morbidity? We don't have that information just yet. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, our last subjects were enrolled at um, um, in late September 2016, and we're still tracking all the final outcomes, but we're going to do that analysis, which is not the answer yet. David? I assume that would be true. Traumatic brain injury. The survival of traumatic brain injury for adults and children have improved over the decades. Um, in 1980 or so, the mortality rate in adults was about 45% and children was probably 35% or so. And now we're into the 18 range for, for this. But most studies have actually, it's adapted one of the first studies that included everybody. So RCTs, which exclude a bunch of people who have a lot of sickness, would tend to underestimate mortality rates previously. So it appears we are doing better. It's unclear exactly how much better. But that speaks specifically to the issue of survival as opposed to functional survival and quality after, after survival. Is that correct? Right. No one's measured functional survival after, besides the National Traumatic Coma Data Bank, which was in the 80s, um, and ADAPT is, is the leading group looking at it right now, so we don't know. So that was the first part of the question. So we've improved survival just as we have in the micro premature baby, who 24 and 25 week preemies are now surviving. Right. But a subset of them are surviving with disability, clearly better than when many of us older people were in training in the 1980s. But the question is, we've improved survival, um, but survival perhaps of not as well-functioning individuals as we would hope to create through, through aggressive medical management. So have we created a new category and diagnosis of disease just as BPD did not exist before we could help premature babies survive? And are we now dealing with a new category of disease, which is neurologic deficits following traumatic brain injury, which we have helped to survive in the ICU? It's a complex social problem in the end. It's, I agree with you. It's hard to know if we're making differences, like if we're, if we're changing the parameters or not. It's hard to know that. Um, when, you can complain a lot about TBI research in the past. You can't complain that they haven't tried to look at functional outcomes extensively for decades. Uh, the GOS score, which was a five-point score, um, did look at disabilities of, you know, mild, moderate, severe disabilities. And uh, TBI research has been hampered in some degree because they are so strict regarding their outcomes that if the outcome is not, um, mortality is not, a, not sufficient for a good outcome. So an example of that is the DECRA trial, which is a um, decompressive surgery trial that was done in Australia. They decompressed, they did decompressive surgery and, and Improve mortality, improve mortality in the treated group, but also increased vegetative states and non-functioning people more so. And so that, was, that trial was considered a failure because it did not improve both things at the same time. So TBI has been quite forward about that. The difficulty in the question you're answering is there are patients who don't survive from TBI often have withdrawal support. And the, and the, the views of people taking care of patients regarding how, how aggressively to withdraw support or not to withdraw support can, out, can affect the number of patients you get who are severely disabled. That difference is not trivial. I think that's fair. I'm, I'm simply getting at the fact that between metabolic gene disease, genetic diseases, very small premature infants, children with palliated cardiac lesions who will ultimately go on to need heart transplantations, 
patients with traumatic brain injury or hypoxemic brain injury that we pull through, we sneak through with aggressive management. We're creating a whole new category of diseases in childhood that we have to deal with that has enormous social implications as well as the scientific curiosity as to how to make the outcomes better. I'm making that point for the current generation of trainees. I agree with, I agree with that completely, and I'll channel my Murray Pollack in this, in this realm and say that all critical illnesses have gotten incrementally better in mortality, respiratory failure, heart disease, renal disease, every, all the critical illnesses have gotten slightly, have gotten better. The question for me is, has TBI done better than that or worse? I can't tell that question. That's really the relevant question is, has TBI been dragging us behind or been leading the field? I can't, I don't know the answer to the question. <laughs> Well, thanks for your attention. I appreciate it.